Hey everybody, Dave Riesinger here. Thank you for tuning in. We are in our John Journal, John series. If you didn't get the journal, uh, please pick one up at redeem.church. We're going through the Gospel of John as a church and folks that don't attend Redeem um, are going through it as well. It's a 46 day devotional. So I wanna give another plug. We've shipped out a couple hundred of these already and we would love for you to get on board. And then what we're doing each week for our sermons the message we're giving is out of one of the places in John's gospel. Today we're going to be in John 15, and the title of the message is, Do You Want to Get Well? That might seem like an odd question Jesus asked. In fact, the question that we're about to see Jesus ask a man who's in a bad place physically, it seems a little impersonal what he asks him. And then after asking what seems to be an impersonal question, he then asks the man to accomplish what seems to be an impossible task. And I want you to see yourself in the story. I want you to imagine that in the area you need healing and you need wellness or you need freedom, I want you to hear what Jesus is saying to you and I. Because I can tell you straight up, there have been times in my life that the Lord has come to me and he's asked me that same question. And that question requires a response. And we're gonna dive into what that response looks like and how it should look in our lives. So let's read John 5, 1 through 15. I'm gonna start and I'm gonna just kind of break things down as we go. And uh, I just hope that the Lord speaks to you. It says here in verse one, sometime later there was a feast of the Jews and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there was in Jerusalem near the sheep gate a pool, okay? So he, here's the pool scene. There's a bunch of people laying around a pool. And it says, with five colored colonnades, which in Aramaic is called Bethesda. On these walkways lay a great number of sick, the blind, the lame, and the paralyzed. I want you to get this picture in your mind because it's summertime, uh, <clears throat> the birds are chirping, the sun has been out in the great Pacific Northwest. Can I get an amen? This is incredible. We suffer all year with rain. I don't want to complain, but the rain makes the sun look so much better in this part of the country. But man, I go outside. It gets hot during the summer and we got this short little window. And some of you do this. You take your family to the community pool or maybe you've got one in your house or you go on vacation and you're soaking up the sun. Our pool scene looks a lot different than this one. The pools that we go to, we've got kids splashing, wearing floaties. We've got people kicking back, you know, and having a good time. Some folks got music playing. They've got a barbecue off to the side. This is different. If you would have went to this pool during this feast and seen this scene, it wasn't a bunch of kids with floaties on. There were no barbecues going on. This was the sick, the lame, the crippled, the paralyzed, invalids. Those who were sick. Now, why were they hanging around the pool? They're, they're all on this edge, and it's just near the temple. Well, here's what's happening. They are waiting for a miracle. They're waiting for what legend said happened, and we're going to read it in a moment, but they were waiting for the water to just miraculously start stirring, and if they could jump into the water, there might be a chance that they could get healed. They were waiting for this random moment that their life could be changed. And it goes on and says this, verse 5, one man there had been an invalid for 38 years. So here, here the camera zooms from this pool. Now it moves in and it zooms in on one man. And his story's about to emerge. And there's a faith lesson in the story. 38 years, he's an invalid. Now we might think of invalid as somebody who was maybe paralyzed. Maybe he was a, a quadriplegic or paraplegic. That's actually not what the word means. The word invalid here means, when you look it up in the Greek, it just means weak. He'd been sick. He had some ailment that for 38 years had continued to zap his strength so that he could barely function whatsoever. And he's laying there. We don't know how long, how many days, how many years, how many weeks he spent at this pool scene, but we know that he was there and he had been suffering for quite a long time. I don't know if you can relate. Don't, don't just think that this is a story about a man who lived 2,000 years ago and it has no connection to you. Because I want to ask you a question. Have you or do you feel weak in an area of your life? 
What do I mean by that? Maybe it's physically, but you know what? So many times in our life, it's not a physical weakness that causes us to be incapacitated or, or keeps us from the life that we desire. But you know what it is? It's a weakness and it's a lack of strength emotionally or spiritually. Have you ever felt like this? Because I'm telling you straight up, I have. Have you ever felt like, yeah, I, I know, I know this is where I need to be in life. I just, I don't have the strength to get up and do it. It might be chronic depression. It might be chronic confusion. It might be this, just this lack of, this lack of hope or, or, or sense of value. It might be a, a lack of the ability to dream. And so you lay by your pool, if you will, and you hope that somehow one day randomly the breakthrough lottery is going to hit and you're going to find yourself healed by some lucky circumstance that's outside of your ability. Now, watch this because there's so many of us in this place. Oh, you got fired to go make money. You, you're, you're killing it at work, but you come home and you don't have strength for your marriage. Or, or maybe you're, you're great around your friends, but when you go home, you live with this sense of, of, of depression or insecurity. You feel like you never measure up and you don't have the strength to overcome it. I don't know what your weakness is and I don't know if you've suffered for 38 years with it, but I want to show you what Jesus has to say about those of us who barely have enough strength to stand, let alone dream that we could be totally healed. Check this out. We go to verse six and it says, when Jesus saw him lying there, now watch this, and realized that he had spent a long time in this condition, he asked him, do you want to get well? Do you find that a strange question? Do you want to get well? Does a starving man want to eat? Surely. The answer would be yes. Does a thirsty woman want to take a drink? Right? Why would you ask? The question seems so odd because the answer seems so obvious, right? Doesn't it seem a little impersonal? You see a guy laying there and then Jesus, I don't know if somebody told him or just because he had supernatural knowledge, he knew that he'd been laying there for a long time and he asked him, hey buddy, do you want to get well? Right? What, what, what other answer is this guy going to give? Yeah, no, I'm good, Jesus. It's fine. No, I'm good. Maybe a little back rub. You know, I got a little tension in my neck or uh, you got a bag of Takis or hot Cheetos. You know, I get a little snacky laying by the pool. You know, I'd love a little yum yum in my tum tum, if you know what I mean. Just pool life. What else is he going to say? This almost seems kind of rude until you realize what Jesus is getting at, right? What do you mean, do I want to get well? Well, if you think the question is odd because you think the answer is obvious, notice what Jesus considers before asking the question. He considers the man's condition and he also considers the calendar, right? He, he said, oh, this man's not just laying here weak without strength, but he's been here for 38 years. And I don't know about you, but it, logically, this is proven scientifically, and there is a supernatural exception to this rule, and I'll explain that in a minute, but when you are in a situation for years after years after years, the longer we see, the longer we experience, the longer we live a certain way, the harder it is to change those ways. You know, when we develop a habit, they say a habit can be developed in 21 days. Some people say 40 days. But what happens is, is it takes willpower and effort and it takes um, a, a commitment to develop a habit. And then after that, when the habit is developed, it's no longer by force or by will, but it's by, man, it just seems like second nature. You cross into this thing where it just seems kind of easy. I still have to show up but the habit creates a momentum of itself. And so I think what Jesus was getting at here is he's saying, hey man, before um, I perform this miracle, do you really want, let me rephrase it. Maybe he says it this way. After 38 years of this reality, are you sure you want another reality? And, and it's interesting the word want. Do you want to be healed? In the Greek, here's what the word means. It's this Greek word othello or ethelo. 
and it means to will, wish, desire, and intend. It means to desire with a readiness and willingness to act. Jesus may be getting to the other side of healing in his question, and that's this. If you get healed, things are going to change, my man. It's going to be awesome, and there's the benefit of the breakthrough. But on the other side of breakthrough, because you know in this culture, like you're sitting around the temple by the pool, and out of charity, the Jews are going to give you food because you have to be charitable. It's a commandment in the Torah. It's a commandment in the law. But the minute you have strength, you might have to go get a job. And in this culture, if you don't work, you don't eat. 38 years without developing a skill. 38 years without having to actually show up and do work because you couldn't. You are now going to be in a category that demands responsibility. And if you get healed, there's going to be a new requirement on your life. Jesus is pausing because he's asking a question that some of you and myself have been asked. Dave, do you really want to change? Do you really want a new life? Because that new life will require new habits, a new mindset, a new pattern, new effort, right? Now it's by his grace, I get it. But at the same time, it wasn't odd. It was actually awesome. Because the Lord was diving in to the psyche and the soul of man when it comes to some of these things. Now check this out. I don't know if you remember, you can go back to the children of Israel in the wilderness. So we go back there in Egypt for hundreds of years. And they've suffered under a heavy hand and it's bondage and slavery and there's no freedom. God calls them out. There's 10 plagues. Read the story in Exodus. They go through a Red Sea, celebration, high fives, you know, fireworks going off, the whole nine. But it wasn't long that you see how they responded to freedom. They started to complain because they were once living as slaves, but now they're free and they're, they have to live by faith. And, and basically they started to say, let us go back into our old condition. With Pharaoh, captivity was hard, but at least it was predictable, right? And, and, and so we, slu- we suffered in slavery and maybe we'd rather go back and suffer in slavery because at least we knew what to expect and we knew our bellies would have food in them at the end of the night, even though we didn't have the opportunity for freedom. But Moses, you bring us out here and now we're stepping into freedom and it's something we've never known and we'd rather have predictability than have opportunity that demands a new way of thinking and a new way of living. And this is part of the freedom that we need when freedom is offered to us. We need freedom from our condition, but we also need freedom from the mind that wants to pull us back into the condition and keep us stuck. Because when we step out, it requires that we trust in a new way. Verse seven says this, the invalid replied. He said, do you wanna be made well? He, He replied, I have no one to help me into the pool. When the water is stirred, while I'm on my way, someone else goes in before me. So quickly, there was this legend, and it might be true, because he says, I've seen it happen, and um, there was an angel that used to come and stir the pool, and if they could get in when this angel stirred the pool, the first people to get in would be healed. He basically says, everybody beats me there. They're quicker. Can you imagine the scene right here? Can you imagine, have you ever been in a situation where there was frenzy, there was a limited amount, there was a ton of people, and whoever got there first, like, got it, and everybody else got left out? That's Black Friday every single year, right? It's a frenzy. With uh, this whole COVID-19, you see, like, good luck finding hand sanitizer right now. Can I get an amen? Like, I went, every time I've gone to the store, I just go down the aisle, see if there's one can that got forgotten. It's gone. Why? Because people are on it. There's a limited supply. There's a frenzy. I heard a story about uh, folks buying all these, you know, toilet paper and Lysol and One lady had her whole shopping cart full of toilet paper and another lady had none and she just tried to take one out of her cart and the lady shanked her. She stabbed her, right? Why? Because there's this fear that I need this for survival. I I can't imagine that. Now, I'd shank somebody over some KFC, but not some TP. Come on. I mean, can we get real? Have you ever, I remember we did this, (laughs) 
We did, we did this outreach, like we wanna bless our community. We're gonna do an Easter egg dash. Um, we're gonna do the big Easter egg hunt. So we put it out to the community. We set everything up. We rented these rock climbing walls and these bouncy houses. And, and, and we just, we're ready to just pour out love on the community. And all of a sudden we had thousands of people literally show up. We're in this football stadium on this turf field. And, and so we're like, man, we need to create you know, some walkways and we're gonna have to readjust how we're doing this thing. So instead of a hunt, we did an Easter egg dash. So we lined all these eggs up. We put kids on this side, kids on this side, parents are in. We blew a whistle, we started a timer, we played the music and the kids could scramble. We thought it would be fun and 90% of it was fun. But there was a frenzy when all of a sudden you see some kids snatching eggs from other kids. And now you got a kid who was showing up and he's hoping to have a good time. And now he's literally, he's not trying to get an egg. He's sitting there bawling his head off. Mom's yelling at this other kid. We had one lady actually grab somebody else's kid, pull, pull the kid off of her kid because they were fighting over an egg. And then another parent jumps in. You know, we had another parent calling an airstrike. F-15s came in, missiles are going off. I mean, it was absolute chaos. And all we wanted to do was just bless the community. Can you imagine? That's a frenzy over some toilet paper and some Easter eggs, right? Can you imagine the kind of frenzy that took place when you have a pool full of sick people and they're waiting and all of a sudden the water stirs. These are folks that cannot move fast anyways. Can you, I mean, just, and loved ones dragging their, their crippled loved ones into the pool, right? Anybody to get in, this is about my healing. And so this man obviously had never made it to the pool if this actually happened because he was still sick. Now check it out, this is where we get into what Jesus confronts in the man and does in the man and he wants to do in us. <clears throat> and then I'm gonna close here in a minute. So imagine the water stirring, it's the panic. Can you imagine the, the desperation and then the tears? I didn't get in. This only happens once a year. This only happens once every three years. Can you imagine the anger? I was so close and I didn't get it. And so the self-pity can kick in. It's funny when Jesus says, do you wanna be made well? He didn't say yes, he just said, I got no one to help me. I can't do it unless someone else helps me. Might have been a little self-pity going on there. I don't know what was going on, but if you look at Jesus' response, it is such a great lesson to you and I today. Jesus told him, get up, pick up your mat, and walk. Do you realize that Jesus didn't waste one breath on excuses? The man was like, hey, I got no one to pick me up. I have no help. I have no one to do this for me. Jesus just simply gives him this impossible action. Now think about it. If he could have got up and walked and picked up his mat, he would have done it. Again, it seems like, man, why are you asking me to do something that I cannot do? And if you notice when freedom or breakthrough or healing comes into our lives, many times it's God asking us to do what seems improbable or impossible. But when we meet God by stepping out of the boat, and acting on something that doesn't make any natural sense, God's power meets our response in a way that creates a breakthrough miracle. So he's telling this man, get up, grab your mat, and walk. Now watch this. This man had no idea that he was talking to the living word of God. He didn't know that this was the Messiah. He had no idea this was Jesus, the son of God. In fact, we'll read here in a second. Um, he's like, I have no idea who the guy was. He just told me to get up, grab my mat and walk, right? And so I think a lot of times in Christianity, I've done this in my own life. I've seen this in so many people. We get our theology right in our minds, but we don't see theology move in motion through our actions. So many times we have the right answer, but what God wants is the right action. No, it's not about works that save us, but I tell you what, like we are to connect the two. We have this issue in Christianity. I see people have a hard time, Christians have a hard time connecting faith and works, and yet the Bible marries them so beautifully. James 1.22 says, be doers of the word, not just hearers only, otherwise you're deceiving yourselves. 
Jesus is saying, hey, don't just meditate on it, move on it, right? Let me read you just a, a few scriptures back to back that marry both of these. Now we think, well, no, it's not about works. Uh, it's not about my effort. Um, because doesn't the Bible say in Ephesians 2.8, for by grace you've been saved through faith, and it's not of my own doing, it is a gift from God? For sure. You are not saved because of what you did, but your doing happens because you're saved. Paul said it this way, show me your faith apart from your works, and I'll show you my faith by my works. He's saying, I don't work to be saved, but because I'm saved, I put in effort. Here's another one, Philippians 2.12. This is the end of that verse. It says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Another one, Matthew 6.24. Then Jesus said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciples must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. You know what the Lord is communicating to us? He's saying this, I'll do the heavy lifting, but you need to do the healed living. Let me say this again. Jesus offers us a miracle of freedom and breakthrough when he extends the question, are you ready for this? Do you really want it? And if you do, then I want you to meet me with an action of response that is rooted in faith, especially for the believer. And I will do the heavy lifting of healing, but you walk out this healed life with your effort and trust in me. And oh, by the way, when my spirit lives in you, the same way Jesus said in John 14, you know, uh, he, he talks about, if you love me, then you'll obey my commands. Oh, and I will send another helper and he will be with you. And then one day he'll be in you. He was talking to the disciples before Pentecost. So even the effort that we do offer, the willpower or the, the pressing, it's still fueled and sustained by the spirit of God that lives in us but I just want to get real here. I think there's a lot of times that we are laying by a pool and we have the word and yet we don't act on it. Here's a man who doesn't even de demonstrate faith in Christ. He doesn't have the faith, but he responds to the word and the respond to the word set him free. I think we're in the opposite. We have the word and, and God says, I'm presenting you a way out. I'm giving you an opportunity. And, and he cycles back, are you ready yet? Are you ready yet? And so many times in my own life, I'm like, I'm looking for a new answer. I'm looking for an easier answer. But Jesus is like, I gave you the word. I asked you to step out. Will you trust me? I think there's a lot of Christians right now that need to get up, grab your mat, and walk. You've laid down long enough. You need the fight back in you. You know, I, I, I've had parents come, <clears throat> my kids are rebellious and I remember being a youth pastor for 15 years. My kids just, they're, they're so apathetic in their walk with God. Um, can I ask you a question, mom and dad? Are you taking them to church? Are you spending the time giving them a ride and making sure that they can be involved with the church life? Well, we got a busy schedule and you know our, uh, our nights are our time to just unwind and so we don't have anybody that wants to come pick them up. I'm like, okay. <clears throat> I get it, I get it, life is busy, but my greatest priority would be the eternal soul of my kids, and so I'm going to act in those areas that are the most important. And so I wanna ask, I know this is challenging, but the Lord has challenged me. What areas of your life have you been laying by a pool, waiting for the lottery of healing to come, and Jesus said, Will you just get up and do what you don't think you can do or don't feel like you can do and watch my super get added to your natural when you respond to my call for healing? And finally, it says this, and we'll close. Immediately, the man was made well, and he picked up his mat and began to walk. Now, this happened on the Sabbath day. So the Jews said, who is this man? Uh, uh, so the Jews said to the man who had been healed, this is the Sabbath. It's unlawful for you to carry your mat. But he answered, the man who made me well told me, pick up your mat and walk. Who is this man who told you to pick up your mat and walk? <clears throat> they asked. But the man who was healed did not know who it was, for Jesus had slipped away while the crowd was there. Afterwards, Jesus found the man in the temple and said to him, see, 
You have been made well. Stop sinning or something worse may happen to you. And the man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had made him well. Look, Jesus went after the physical healing so that he could actually bring a spiritual healing. And he simply asks us whether it's the need for spiritual, relational, physical, uh, mental, emotional uh, stress or weakness. What if we were people who acted more than just intended? And I know it's a challenge to myself. There's areas in my life right now that I know God is challenging me and I've made excuses why (laughs) I'm not there yet. And God is so gracious. He's so loving. Don't you love that he just went and sought out a broken person? So don't think this is Jesus saying, hey, pick yourself up by your bootstraps, buddy. Like if you want to get, you know, if you want to make it in life, then you better, you better pick yourself up. He's not saying that. You know what he's saying? He's saying, no, I'll, I'll, it'll be my power that sustains you. But I just want to know that your heart is in this and that you believe it's possible. Respond to my word. Some of you right now are in a bad place. And I'm telling you right now, God is using this message to call you off of your bed, onto your feet, and into your walk. If you're here right now watching and you don't know Jesus, you don't know the man that is calling to you right now, there is a God who sent his son, Jesus Christ, who is God, who died on the cross for you, who rose from the dead so you could have eternal life. There is salvation in no one else other than him. And then he says, all who believe on me will be saved. Anyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Saved from what? Our sins separated us from God, but his blood atoned for those sins. He took our sin on himself. He shed his innocent blood. And those who put their faith in him are given his righteousness. And we are made pure and perfect in the eyes of God so that we can be brought into relationship now and we can be with him for eternity. If you've never put your faith and trust in Jesus, I'm going to pray and I'm going to ask you to believe and receive eternal life and and watch God give you a strength you didn't think you could ever have and a new life. And for everybody else, whatever bed you're laying on, let's believe that God is going to give you the faith and the courage to act instead of just intend. Can we pray? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for those watching. And I pray that you would do a miracle in each heart and each life. I pray the excuses be squashed. I pray that the doubt be diminished. I ask that, Father God, all of the years of habitually living below your intended desire would be removed. That we would be able to simply act and jump at the word of God the same way Peter did not have concrete or a dock floating out of him when you called him to walk on water. He stepped out on the word and the water became walkable. And I'm asking right now, whatever area that somebody is facing watching this that is too afraid or too defeated, we ask that, Father, you would bring victory and bring hope to that person. And we ask that there would be an absolute healing breakthrough in their lives. And we thank you for those who are responding to faith in you as well. God, may they turn to you and follow you and see the benefit of this new life. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, I'm so glad that you were able to watch. Um, Thank you for tuning in. And again, if you want to get connected, you need some questions answered, you want one of our John journals, um, or you want prayer, go to redeem.church and we would love to follow up with you. Share this message with somebody who needs hope. We'll see you next week. God bless.